part here, this definite integral. Is that, anybody have any thoughts about that? We've got over, I think like three questions regarding this topic. trigger something in your mind is that it's a definite integral mm -hmm. from a constant to something with x in it of a function of t, not of x. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Normally, yeah, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Normally, though, it would look like, like, how does this look different from what the fundamental theorem of calculus says? Yeah, no, that's, that is fundamental theorem of calculus. No, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Second, what's that? Uh, yeah, that's different, but like if we ignore that five for a second, like whatever we find here will just add five to it. That's not a big deal, right? Yeah. Um, is the, the integral, is it the number, or it, is it the constant? Why don't you guys look up in your notes, if you take good notes, and look up in your book, if you have a book, about the second part of the calculus. Started to, but then we go to x, though it may still be this function, right? So the second fundamental theorem of calculus would say, uh, let's see. Oh man, I didn't get the statements. That's going to be hard to answer. Hold on. Yeah. Right. What number was that? Thirteen. Thirteen. 13. Yeah, Questions that it's asking about? Yeah. The derivative of the function. Okay? Dy dx. So let's um so let's grab those multiple choice options. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. okay. So there are the multiple choice options. We're supposed to decide. Which of these things is true? Clearly, all of the statements are about the derivative, so we're going to have to investigate the derivative of this function. And in doing that, if we take dy dx equals what's d5 dx? Zero. Okay, zero plus zero plus the derivative of this guy. Hey, look at that, except for this is slightly different. Right? This is to x, that's the 2x. So we know we're looking at the derivative, the, the definite integral from a constant to x of a function of t, which is what the second fundamental theorem of calculus is all about. So this would be what? How, what, what would this be according to the fundamental theorem of calculus? Just replace the t with x. Yeah, just replace the t with x. The e to the negative x squared, not plus c. Because remember, this is a definite integral, right? We, we did this, right? We found that, like, we would plug this in, and then we would plug this in, we'd subtract, and then we'd take the derivative, and then we'd find that the derivative of that constant that we found when we plugged in 2 is 0, and so it goes away. Okay? <coughs> or the, the c's would just cancel. Um, the thing is, though, it's not to x. It's to 2x, right? Okay. This thing right here, if it was to two, if it was to x, just like this, that we, we should be, right now, after having done several of these, 
at least thinking like, oh yeah, there's an X there, and there's T's there, and uh, at least ringing those bells, okay? So since it's not to X, it's to two X, we're taking the derivative. It's now not a function of X, it's a function of two X. So when we get done, taking the derivative according to the second fundamental theorem of calculus, since it's not just x there, it's 2x, we need to use the chain rule. Okay? The chain rule on this guy right here. So we multiply by 2. It says, see example 8 on page 290, so if you do have your book and you look at page 290, look at page 8. Or uh, uh, example eight. Actually, I have it here. Ready? So I'll open that up. This, this is uh, exactly the kind of situation we're looking at. It's uh, from a constant to a uh, function of x of the cosine of t dt. So it's a fundamental, second fundamental theorem of calculus situation. You can see they're saying that the derivative of f is going to be df du times du dx. That's the chain rule. So the derivative of, it basically boils down to we, oh, you let's see. Um, it's the cosine of u times the derivative of u, and u is x cubed. So if we go back to our work, uh, we should also get to the negative 2x squared times the derivative of 2x. Okay. Okay, so look at the difference. If it were from 2 to x, we're taking the derivative of the indefinite rule from 2 to x of e to the negative <coughs> t squared dt, then we would just replace all of the these with those, right? So just e to the negative t squared. Yeah. Or sorry, x, not t. x squared. But it's not an x, it's a 2x. So it's not e to the negative x squared, it's e to the negative 2x squared. And then we use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of that. And if that were a function within a function, we multiply by the derivative of the inside function, and we just keep going the second one with the chain rule. It's just a chain rule situation. Right. Um, so the derivative of 5 is 0. The derivative of this using the second fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule, we get that. So the question is, the, the derivative is this? Is that there? Let's take a look. Over there. Is that what it is? No. Not that. It's still not that. Um, it's not this, right? Because it's times 2. So it's 2e to the negative 2x squared, okay, which if we square 2x, we get 4x squared. Okay, so it's got to be one of these. Right? And it says y of 0 is 5 or y of 1 is 5. What does that mean? To what? What's, where's y. 4x in yeah. the function y. Where's the function y? What the whole thing was? Plus that plus five. This? Plus five. No, the original. This is why. Let's see why. Oh. The original. So for the, the second part of the statement, we don't concern ourselves with this. Right? It's all about y. <coughs> so then we, we give that a try. So we say y of 
zero is five plus from two to two times zero of e to the negative t squared dt. So that's from two to zero. Which if you'll notice, that's two back to zero. So normally this goes from left to right, left to right, so from right to left. Okay. That's okay. It's, it's still going to be this guy minus that guy. Five plus, what's the antiderivative of e to the negative t squared? What's that? E to the negative t squared. Um, when we take the derivative of this, we need to wind up getting this. Oh, um. Negative one half. Check you with C. Yeah. Well, it's got to be D. It can't be E. Why can't it be E? Isn't the answer E? Yeah, isn't the answer E? If you one for X, that's E. And two to two. That's just there is zero. Oh. Well, what'd you say? It, it has to be D, so it can't be E. No, it has to be E. Oh, it has to be E, not D. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're right, that's, uh, that's an obvious one that I wasn't looking at. So, Great job, Kim. So explain it, Tiny, so that you get all the credit. You plug 1 in for x. In for x here. And the integral is going to be 2 to 2. Yeah. And that's just area 0. Yeah, there's, there's no area here. Yeah. There's a line, right? From 2 to 2, the left side and the right oh, side so of this area. So then it's just 5 plus nothing. Oh, great job, Tim. Job tying us in art. Ours. You're so smart. It's so amplifying. Okay. So, one big moral of the story here is remember the second fundamental theorem of calculus is out there. Okay. And just so that you're really quick on the draw on this time test. What can help you recognize that they might want you to be using the fu second fundamental theorem of calculus? Two different variables. It goes from a constant to an x. It has to go from a constant to an x, okay? okay. And then the function is of some other variable, okay? And when I say it has to be x, it has to be just some variable, some variable other. Uh, yes? What if it's not just some other variable? Like, what if it was like from two to two? Uh, that shouldn't happen. Oh, I have a quick question. Yeah. So for on the last two, mm -hmm. or actually, when it's saying negative four x mm -hmm. squared. Yeah. I'm. How do we get the negative four though? That's kind of what I'm just. Because the the second fundamental theorem of calculus would be like a straightforward problem of the second fundamental theorem of calculus would be this one, mm -hmm. where it's. Where it's from two to x, not two x, mm -hmm. okay, and then you just replace the twos with x's, and it'd be pretty straightforward. Okay, but it's from two to two x, mm -hmm. so we replace this 
Not with x, but with 2x, with whatever that is. Oh, okay. So there's your 2x squared, and you get more. Okay. Okay. And there's that negative was, was part of this function. Okay. We did 15, 16. Um, we started to talk about 18 real quick, but we didn't really follow through on it. Did we need to follow through on that? about this a little more um, and I can draw a better graph. So it's going to happen. All right. So if we were to uh, graph these points and then talk about what this all this stuff says. Uh, here's let's say one and let's make one bigger. One and two just so we can have a, a big scale. Because we only going from 1.1 to 1. So here's 1.5, there's 1, here is 1.1, 2, 3, 4, okay? And we go uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, we'll go up to 5, because all the y values are between 4 and 5. So at 1.1, we get 4.18, 4.18 is uh, somewhere right there it seems. And then 4.38, right about there. 4.56, maybe there. 4.73, maybe right there. Okay. So what it's saying is that the the, the function, uh, the, the second derivative of the function is always negative for all x enclosed in the interval from one to two. So from one to two, right, from x is one to x is two, it's concave down. What does it mean is concave down as, as far as its slope, as far as its tangent, slope of its tangent lines? Here, I'll draw something that's concave down. It's concave down. Positive slope, negative slope, negative slope. So at, from, from any point to any other point, from left to right, whatever slope you have here on the left, <laughs> as you go to the right, the slope will be smaller. Yeah. Including going into the negatives, negative numbers are smaller mm -hmm. than positive numbers, right? So it's decreasing. The slope is always getting smaller. So that's, that's something we can say about this. So the, the shape of this graph is, is concave down. It's an upside down bowl like that. Um, let's talk about the table. So if you guys are showing me the table above, which is following is true about f prime of 1.2. f prime of 1.2, what is it talking about there? What does f prime of 1.2 mean? Right, okay, and how can the, what will that look like on the graph? What, what about the graph is given to us by plugging 1.2 into the slope, the slope of the tangent line? Yeah. yeah, okay, so here's 1.2, right here. There's the point at 1.2. Here's the slope at 1.2, okay? We have no way of figuring out what the slope is, right? Agreed? Well, what can we say about the slope? What, what can we say about slopes in general in this function? Like what kind of slopes can we find? Well, they'll be positive when we find them. What's that? It's not a, because clearly all these slopes are positive, right? Unless, unless we got to the negative slope somehow, you know, can't be. it's between two positive slopes, right? From here to here, positive slope, from here to here, positive slope, so it's got to be also positive because it's always concave down. Yeah. It's what? It's always decreasing. So how about if we find the slope here, can we find the slope between these two points? Yeah. And the slope between these two points? Yeah. And how will this slope compare? 
close to it. How will it compare to this slope? Less and a little bit compared to this one? A little bit more, a little steeper. A little steeper than this, a little less steep than this. So if you find those slopes, it's between those slopes, lines of those slopes, which you can see that's what these statements are saying. Okay? So we just find those slopes. How are we going to find the slope between here and here? So we got. Uh, 4.38 minus 4.18 over uh, 1.2 minus 1.11. Uh, 4.38 minus 4.18 is 0.2. Let's see. We can use our calculator on this, so that could definitely shorten up this process. 0.2 over 0.1 is what? Okay. So the slope from here to here is, is 2, and this slope should be bigger or smaller than 2? Smaller. The slope here is steeper than the slope right here, which is steeper than the slope right here. Look at that. It's the only one that mentions that this slope must be less than 2. It's got to be between 2 and some other slope. You may want to make sure they're not trying to trick us into something and make sure that the other slope is 1.8 or, or greater than 1.8. Okay. Uh, Sophie, can you summarize what we just did and how we can reason our answer? between these two points and these two points and said that this slope must be somewhere between the, those two slopes. Yeah. And how do we know that for sure that this slope must be smaller than this but bigger than this? It's not get down. It's really key. If we didn't know that, we couldn't really say that. Because it could do all sorts of little crazy things like that and we would have no idea what the slope was. Unless maybe they gave us some other kind. particles start at the origin and move along the x-axis from times 0 to 10. Their respective position functions are given by their functions, right? They're the position functions, that's how far away they are from the origin at time t. Okay? So you plug a number in there, clearly this is the sign of t, right? So sometimes it'll be uh, at a positive distance away from the origin, and then sometimes it'll be at a negative distance away from the origin. That's the way the sign works. Uh, this guy right here, this is uh, an exponential decay. Okay, so it's uh, distance starts at the origin. So it's going to move away very quickly, fairly quickly, and then kind of not move it very far away very quickly at all. Okay. Not that that's terribly important, but uh, th those, two those two functions are position functions. Or how many values of t do the particles have the same velocity? Velocity, not position. So throw some, uh, something we got to do. When it gives us position function and then it asks us questions about the velocity. Let's take the derivatives. Okay? So this x1, don't misinterpret that as being x. So if you would plug x in there. It's going to actually tell you x. This is a function of what? Yeah. Of t. It's a function of t. It's not a function of x. What's that? It's dx dt is what we're going to find, right? So don't think of taking the with respect to x. So dx1 dt is equal to what? Cos and cosine of t. All right. Uh, 
dx2 of dt is into the negative 2t. Okay, I mean, you may not know a whole lot about what you're supposed to do, but you should, like there should be immediately, like a flash or a bell ringing in your mind, you see position function and velocity, take the derivative of the position function to get the velocity function. Okay. Things like that help, just writing something down, getting rolling, doing something that's clearly something that's part of this problem. What's your I am about to sneeze. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 the record is basically like this thing. <laughs> 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 this <laughs> class. <laughs> That's what you're facing. Yeah, I know. I this class. <laughs> the period after the rework. Um, all right. Uh, so we have the, the two velocity functions. Just reading the question again, even if we were kind of clueless, should get us one step further. Mm -hmm. All right, we got the velocity functions. They are, th these functions are valid between times zero to 10. Uh, their respect to position functions, da, 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 da. For how many values of t do the particles have the same velocity? And if I plug in t for this function, it'll tell me how fast the function is going. If I plug in t into this function, it'll tell me how fast this, this, this uh, particle is moving. Right, how do I figure out when they have the same velocity? Whenever we're asked when they have the same values, well, both functions' jobs are to put out values. And if we want to know when those values are the same, we just have to equal each other. The cosine of t equals e to the negative 2 t times negative 2. That seems like a real chore, isn't it? Right? Can you solve for t? If cosine of t was equal to some number, I could take the inverse cosine of both sides. If, if negative 2e to the negative 2t was equal to some number, I could divide by negative 2, take the natural log of both sides, divide by negative 2, and have t. But when they're both in these functions, it certainly seems pretty hopeless. But remember, this is, what is this, number, oh, this is number 19, which has this guy, right? We can use our calculators. How do we use our calculators to figure out when these are equal to each other? Not magic. Graph them. Graph them, right? You can at least graph them. You don't maybe know what you're going to do next, but at least you know you're going to graph them. Okay? Stopping a problem because you don't know everything to do all at once is a bad idea. Okay? Might be a good idea to try another problem first and then come back to it, but not to just give up on it. We took the derivative without really knowing what we're going to do next. We set them equal to each other, didn't really know what's going to happen next. We try to solve for t. We don't really know how to do that, so we set the, uh, we graph both of them, and let's see what happens then. So one function will be the cosine of t, or x in, the, in our case, uh, negative 2 times e to the negative 2x, which stands in the place of t. And let's look at the graphs, which I am not zoomed in correctly. change my window so that I'm on the time scale that they're talking about, like from 0 to 10. I'll go 10.1 so that that tick mark is in the window for sure. We'll graph it again. Make sure you're in radians. That's the assumption that they're making, is that you're in radians unless otherwise indicated. Okay. All right. Um, so, wh where, where is, wh what's happening to this function right here? It's getting closer and closer to zero. Okay, so its velocity is getting closer and closer to being zero, to the particle stopping, right? Okay. Um, does anybody have any ideas about how to answer their question? How many times on this time interval do the two particles have the same velocity? Yeah, 
we're setting them equal to each other, we're trying to figure out what value of t, t, gives us the same v. Right? Well, this value of t gives us the same v. For that, for that time t, they have the same v. For that time, they have the same velocity. When they intersect, they're equal to each other. Right? Because what we get out of this is the, the vertical value, the y value. This is the y value of this function. Okay. So to find where, to solve for t, we just find where they intersect. Do we need to go second calc intersection? Why? What's the question? How many times do they have the same velocity? How many times do they have the same velocity? How many times does it look like? Three. 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 Crosses here. It gets closer and closer to zero, but it's still there. Crosses again. They intersect again. Okay. This function is moving forward, but now slowing down and stopping and moving backward. And uh, moving backward at its fastest. Still moving backward, but slowing down. And then stopping and then speeding back up and then coming and stopping and then going negative and then coming back and it'll stop again over here just going back and forth and back and forth like this. Okay? Um, and this function crosses it one, two, three times. So three would be the answer. <clears throat> talked about this topic at the beginning of class. I'm going to give you a um, couple minutes to look at it and you know, just get started, get the ball rolling. Second from fundamental theorem of calculus again. How does the second fundamental theorem of calculus look different from this, this guy right here? It's the derivative of that. Okay, if there's a reason to take the derivative of this, then we're in business. Is there a reason to take the derivative of it? Does it ask us about the derivative of g of x? But this is a function g of x. It's a definite integral from 0 to whatever you plug in for x. Okay. So let's see what happens when we plug in negative 1. 0 to negative 1 of f of t dt. Well, here's a graph of f. What does this mean in terms of the graph of f? Area. The area. Can you find the area from 0 to negative 1? Yeah. From 0 to negative 1? The top part of it? The top part of it? From here to here. Isn't that a right triangle? It's it is a right triangle. A triangle, one half base times height. Yeah, I guess it could be the bottom of the section. One half times. Uh, let's say height is 2. What's the base? It's negative 1. Right? Because we're going from 0 to negative 1. So we can't be like a negative. So we have uh, negative 1. See, what, what number was that? That's 20. 20. 20. This one? Would be negative area. Right here? Yeah. Well, do we want that? No. The, the definite integral is the area between the curve of the line and the x axis. Okay. And then right. it goes to negative 2 and 
Yeah, and then when we, if we were to continue this way, then we would find this area, yeah. which would be actually from, if we're going from right to left, since it's negative, it would actually be from the positive area. But how, we do don't. You, how do you know not to take anything for the area outside of Because the limits of integration tell us where we are. Basically, what it comes down to is there's this function, right? however, it's curved. And we're looking at some x value here. Right? Now, we could use the function. We could just plug in x values that are close to this x value. Right? We could plug in an x value that's over here and over here and find the y values. Right? This function might be kind of cumbersome to use, kind of annoying. So, if you look at the tangent line, As long as we have a way out here, which obviously the y values of those two things are way different. As long as we stay close to home, stay close to x, the y values of the tangent line and the y values of the function itself are almost the same. So when it says use the local linear approximation, it means if you, you know, use the y values of the tangent line to, find, to estimate the y values of the function itself. So for this particular situation, it's telling us that f of 5 is 3, f of 5 is 3. So we know that the graph, whatever it looks like, goes through that one. Okay? And it could look like a lot of different things. It could look like this or that. There's no telling. The only other thing they tell us is that at 5, F prime of five is four. What does that mean at that point? The slope is four. Okay, so um, the slope is four, so we should come down four and over one. <coughs> Get a pretty accurate drawing of that tangent line. Mr. Stewart, hey, can I borrow Connor Kowalski, please? Yeah. All right. Hi, Logan. We all miss you, man. <laughs> What was that? We all miss you. you. You all miss me? All of us. You're not. You're speaking on behalf of people who don't know you're speaking on behalf of me. Well, I just. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you still good at math? Am I? Yeah. No, I got real bad at it. Really bad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. See ya. Oh, wow. Well, well. <laughs> that was the greatest moment of my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we don't know what the function is. Hey, we don't know what the function looks like. It can, it can, it, it could be going like this. It could be going like this. It could be uh, real weird and go like this. Or we don't know what it looks like. We're going to use that tangent line to guess where that function is. You know what the y value of that function is at 4.8. Okay. How are we going to do that? No. Um, Yes. Whatever that point is, yeah. 
But if we take that point and find the slope between that point and this point, then it should be equal to the slope of 4. And then solve for that y value. Okay. So we know the x value is 4.8, right? We know the x and y value of this point. It's 3, or 5 and 3. 5 comma 3. And then this guy here is 4.8 comma, that's what we want to know. So we take y, the thing we want to know, minus 4.8 over, uh, no, 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 y minus 3, y minus 3 over 4.8 minus 5. What should we get? The slope of the slope of that. Which we know? Do we have a 7 or a y or what is that? Four. This? Yeah, that's four point eight. That's a question mark. Oh, okay. The slope is four. <laughs> this should be four. The slope of the line is known. It is four. As long as we keep them in the right order, we can still do it this way. Question mark minus 3, 4.8 minus 5. Okay. So 4.8 minus 5 is negative 0.2. Y minus 3 over negative 0.2. Let's just check and make sure that 22 has. It's on. It's on there. Oh, it's already on there. Keep in mind, we're on number 24 here. The, the, the first part of the test is multiple choice. The multiple choice portion is kind of the two parts. One part you can use a calculator, the other part you can't. This is the part that you can. Okay? You can use your calculator on this part of the multiple choice. So you know that you want to find the antiderivative, but keep in mind you may want to use your, your calculator to help you out. Okay? So let's think about it. Take the antiderivative of the sine of pi e dx over 2 dx. How do you make 
You remember the other day when we used it to find definite intervals, right? Yeah, except it wouldn't work on my calculator, so I didn't really get much out of that. Oh. <laughs> I'll show you how to do it. Um, let's see. So here, here, here's the things that, that I'm thinking through. All right. Now this, I, I only threw these in there because I was fairly certain that we could do them. Um, I'm sure we can figure this out. But I don't, I didn't know exactly how to do each one before I threw it up here. So you're seeing, it looks like to think about it. So here's what I'm thinking. Clearly, we have a function that the derivative is given. The the value of the function that this is the derivative for is given at one, and they, or at zero, and they want to know what the value is at two. So I'm thinking if we take the antiderivative, we're going to have something plus c, right? Um, so that, yeah, that's something plus c. If we plug zero in there, we'll get one. equals 1 minus that something and 0 is plugged in. So let's see what happens that. Can we test your guessing abilities? Say again? Can we test your guessing abilities? Mm -hmm. oh. Guessing abilities? Yeah. Back to this one. Okay. Maybe mistaken. Maybe this is something we need.
It's come to question two. So this is the free response, which means that oh, you're no. graded based on your no, work no. shown. Thank God. <laughs> it's not multiple choice. So we can use our calculator on this one. I have a Only the multiple choice calculator things were mixed up. Oh. That's what the text said. Yeah. So concert tickets went on sale at noon. Time equals zero. That's so this is, means noon. So this is twelve, and this is one o'clock, and so on. Uh, sold out within nine hours. So by nine hours, uh, they had no more tickets. Oh. The number of people waiting in line to purchase tickets at time t, any time t, is given by the table. Um, oh, it's modeled by a twice differentiable function, which means it has a derivative and a second. L is this function between the, the hours of uh, zero hours and nine hours. Values of L and T at various times are given in the table. Okay. So that's just like knowledge that you need to answer the question. The questions are, use the data in the table to estimate the rate at which the number of people waiting in line is changing. At 5.30 p.m. T equals 5.5, show the computation that led to your answer indicate uh, units of <coughs> so let's look at the question again. Use the data in the table to estimate the rate at which the number of people waiting in line was changing. The antiderivative? No. Regular derivative of something. Hmm? Is it the regular derivative of something? Since it's rate of change? So rate of change should indicate that we're looking at derivatives, not antiderivatives. Okay? But what it says is. It, Use the data in the table to estimate the rate at which the number of people waiting is changing. Okay, so it's looking for the where the rate is changing. So second derivative, right? When we take the first derivative, that's the rate of change of people per hour. When we take the second derivative, that's the like the the rate at which the rate of people arriving and waiting in line is changing. Okay, it's like acceleration. So, like the frequency with which they're showing up to the line, you know, is, is are more people showing up per hour, or a few fewer people showing up per hour? Like, uh, there could be more people coming and getting in line, but how fast those people are getting in line could slow down, right? Just like hordes of people coming in, that and, and then but fewer and fewer people coming as time goes on. Still, the rate that they're getting there is positive but the rate at which that's changing is uh, getting, you know, getting smaller, smaller. Okay. Um, so, the, so use the table to, to estimate the rate at which uh, the people showing up is, uh, is changing. So we want to take the, we want to think about the second derivative at time 5.5. First, we need to find the, the value of the first derivative at that point. How do we find the value of the first derivative? All we have are these, these points. We don't know anything else. The slope. How do we find the slope at 5.5? Mm -hmm. what, what would be the two points we're using? Yeah, we would use four and seven because five point five is somewhere in between here. Okay. So one fifty minus one twenty six 
over 7 minus 4 equals So they want to know how fast is the rate changing at 5.5. Draw a picture of this. Really quick picture. So at zero, we're at 120. Then at one, we're at 156. Then 176. Oh, see, that, that's three, so I should space it out a little more. So one, two, three. 176. Twenty-six, so just a little higher than that one. Right, four hours. Okay, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one fifty. So just a little below that second one. There. Uh, and eighty. What did we just find? Eight people per hour. Eight people per hour when? Yeah. Between four, four and seven. seven. Okay. <coughs> so the derivative itself is worth eight here, right? But later it'll be worth more or less. Uh, like oh. on this interval would be worth less, less, right? So it'll be changing this much right? from there to there. Right? It'll have a negative, like people are leaving, leaving the line. Like they've got their tickets and they are leaving and nobody's showing up and, and so the, the total rate at which people are showing up is negative. Right? Over here, Also, people are leaving during that interval overall. Yeah. People showing up, people are leaving, but overall, people are leaving. Okay, they're buying their tickets or they're giving up. Or, uh, um, so here, this slope is 8, right? And later, it will be something else. And before that, it was something else, right? We want to know how fast is that rate changing, right? So... <coughs> What is the what's the rate of change back here? Yeah, we can find out. Let's find the rate of change here and the rate of change here. Maybe How much time do they give you on these problems? The first part is two questions, and I think they give you. I think that's a 
double check it, I think 45 minutes. Trapezoidal sum with three subintervals to estimate the average number of people waiting in a line during the first four hours that tickets were sold. So this is nice. We have this uh, this graph. Uh, don't get long enough. Go ahead and uh, do this. Okay. So what they want to know is the where did it go? The average. Ah, they want to know the average number of people waiting in line during the first four hours. So here are the first four hours. One, two, three, four, right there. It wants to know the average value. The average value of people, right? On average, we're you know, standing in line at any time during that, uh, that interval where there's an average of... Uh, 80 people or 70 people or, or uh, you think it's an average of 200 people? Someone give me a guess. Do you, what do you think? 200? Does that sound reasonable? Do you think there's an average of 200 people waiting in line between no. zero and four hours? No. Why? Because that? there's no numbers on here that are over 200. And to have the average be 200, something would have to be bigger than 200. Do you think an average of 100 people? No. No. It's too far below the average, right? The average is somewhere between the highest and lowest values. Somewhere in here is the average value. Okay. You think the bell's going off? Oh, is the, the fish thing thing? Yeah. So that's my analogy, right? The analogy goes, how does it go off? Oh, gosh. If you were to make waves in yeah. a tank, so and they, really pointy waves. Yeah, and then it finally just settled down. What yeah. would be that uh, value? Yeah. Height, right? And how? What? What do we use to find that average height? The trapezoid. Well, in general, we use the the integral, the area of the curve, right? Yeah. We say whether it's all wavy like this or placid, right? All settled down. The total area of these two regions, whether it's wavy or rectangular, the area would be the same. So if we find the area of the wavy state, it should be equal to the area of the calm state. So if we can find this area, what are we going to do with that area if that area is the same as this area? Divided by the width, right? We're taking this area, we're going to find this area, we're taking this area, we're swishing it down to its average value. Okay. So it's a color like uh, orange, we're swishing it down. The total area will be the same, the total number of people who are waiting in line uh, is going to be the same. We're going to find the average value over that time. So if we find this blue area, we know the orange area is the same, and we know the width of this, what is a rectangle right there, divided by the width of the rectangle, divided by the height of the rectangle. Yeah? Yeah. OK. Any questions? Good questions about that at all? How are we going to find the area of that blue region? Uh -huh. We're going to find trapezoidal. Trapezoidal ruling. With three subintervals, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, they only give us enough data to make three trapezoids. Okay. So we find the area of the first trapezoid, which is what? Or or what will we? You might say over n. It's. Or just the area of trapezoid, right? Oh. You gotta know that. One half times. B1 plus B2 over the height. Right. Okay, so let's see. The, the height we could say is 1 times uh, B1 plus B2, which is 120 plus 156. 
Okay, plus the area of the next trapezoid. Is it Oh, you would use the B minus A around if you didn't know the size of the trap. I remember. If all of the widths were the same. Yeah. Okay. We can look at it and see the width. This would be one half times two times one fifty six plus one seventy six. Plus one half times One, it's the width of one. Oh, uh, yeah. Times 176 plus 126. All of that divided by divided by four. Here I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this. I made it blue because that's the blue, right? The blue area is equal to all that stuff. Okay. And then we divide by four because that's the total width of the interval. The total width of the rectangle that has the same area as the blue region. times 0 to 9, so all the times that we have, what is the fewest number of times at which L prime of t must be equal to 0? Fewest. So that the One, two, three. L prime must be 0. L prime being slope. the slope, right? The derivative of the slope. So where does the slope have to be 0? Uh, at 3. At 3? Oh somewhere around three, right? We know that the slope is positive here and negative here, first derivative test tells us. There's a zero between those two. Negative here, positive here. Zero between those. Positive here, negative here. Zero, negative and negative, double zero. About zero, so three times. Lots of words. Lots of words. Implies that at least three, three values. We don't have to do wrong with pieces like that. Uh, you have to give reasons. Okay. okay. So just us talking about it right now and saying three isn't good enough. Okay. So I, um, you know, you, you can see what it what it's um, going to give you credit for. Okay. Uh, considers change in the sign of L prime. Did we do that? We just need to indicate that we did that. It could be as simple as putting, you know, uh, just kind of like circling this graph and saying L prime is positive, L prime is negative, L prime is positive, L prime is negative, and write a little sentence. Since it's switching from positive to negative, uh, we know from the uh, first derivative test say, that the uh, must be a zero. So there must be a maximum here, there must be a minimum here, there must be a maximum here. Okay? Or, shall I guess, 
We don't know that from the we don't know that from the uh, from the first derivative test because the first derivative test need, starts out knowing that the slope is zero and determines whether it's a maximum or a minimum. But since the the derivative itself is positive and then negative, uh, then somewhere between there, by the intermediate value theorem, there, there must be some point where it's equal to zero, right? So if we were to draw the derivative, um, uh, this color, like it would be positive here and negative here, it's twice differentiable, which means, well, at least it, it means it's continuous is, is the important thing. So somewhere between, on this interval between here and here, since it switches from positive to negative, there must be a place where the, um, where the slope is zero, where the derivative is zero. So consider the change in L prime, uh, the analysis of what that means, and the conclusion that there's three. Let's see. and part D. The rate at which tickets were sold is modeled by that. Okay. What, what does this function, since it's saying it's the rate at which tickets were sold, what does that have to do with this? What's that? Uh, yeah, it influences how people are leaving because they're, they're buying tickets. Okay. Um, also, maybe it has something to do with the derivative. Um, based on the model, how many tickets were sold by 3 p.m., time equals 3, to the nearest whole number? Um, yeah, it doesn't really have anything to do with this data right here. A little bit, because it only has to do with like how many people might be leaving at any time, right? Because this is, but it wouldn't tell us how many people are showing up. It just tells us how many people are like getting their tickets. So this function tells us how fast tickets are being sold. Not how many tickets are sold, but the rate at which they're being sold. Uh, based on the model, how many tickets were sold. So do you see how the function given is about what? Tickets per hour. Tickets per hour, yeah, very good. Rate of change, right? The question is about what? How many tickets were sold. How many tickets were sold, not how many tickets per hour were sold. So it's not even asking about this function directly. It's asking about tickets. This is tickets per hour. This is actual tickets. What's the connection between this tickets per hour function and this, well, if, if there were a function that told you how many tickets were sold at any time? This is the derivative of this here, right? So how would we get from here to there? Take the antiderivative from, or take the definite integral from? How are we going to find the definite integral from 0 to 3? Yeah. So that's something that the, they, they call in the test readers. They read the test and grade it. Um, they're going to want to see that. 0 to 3 of 550 uh, yeah. t e to the negative t over 2 dt. How are you going to find that value? Fastest way possible. Where's your thing? Your calculator. Calculator. You have, you have a calculator which you can use, so you should best use your calculator to find that. So, Callie, you want to? Yeah, can you do that? I will do that. First, you got to put the function in. Let's put these functions out and put the function 550x times e to the negative x over 2. Pause for a second. Okay. If you have any trouble with this, you need to make sure that your window itself like encloses the x values that you want to find the integral of. It encloses the lower and upper limits of an integration. So it goes from 0 to 3 at least. I know that from the previous problem we went from 0 to 10, so my window is so with the lower limit, it would be zero, right? It goes 
second. Everybody ready to see this done? Second cal. All the way at the bottom, the integral, definite integral. It's got to draw the function first. We don't really need to see it. Yeah, mine didn't draw. Yeah. Zero. It's way up here. Oh, okay. Uh, zero is the lower limit. Three is the upper limit. Should do fine. Wait, how did you get it to set the oh. lower limit? It just zero goes. enter. Oh, okay. Whoa. Mine just said error invalid. Yeah. I, I got nine. Probably because your window isn't. So you got you correct. I said two point seven eight four one. Like that. Yeah, your window is going from <laughs> zero to two point huh? three or something. Oh, okay. So you can go zoom standard, you can zoom out, you can yeah. money. set the window you know, okay, so directly. Zoom, standard. Right. Zoom, standard. Zoom, standard. zoom, I know the number six. So can you also have like in math? So yeah, yours will. I don't yeah. think everybody has that. Uh, okay, yeah. That's not I like to use the, <laughs> I like to use this. Because if I ever need to use a function again, then I, it's just still there. If you want to do yours again, I guess you could, if you want to do something different with the function, I don't know, it takes a little more work. But if I want to find the y value of the function, or if I want to find the derivative, or if I want to find anything, uh, I just need to go back to the function that's already in there. But yours, you have to retype it in, or bring it back up and change things. Oh. So, what's the question exactly? Rather the nearest whole number? Oh. Uh, 973. Approximately 973. Everyone just likes to give those decimals. <laughs> but they, they would mark you off points if they wanted. If you don't follow the directions, they will mark you off. Rude. 972, so about 973. Yeah, and right. look, at what look at what they're <laughs> grading you on. Range. Integrand, meaning the thing you're taking the derivative, the, the antiderivative of, which they wrote R of T, we wrote what the actual like other recited equation looked like, doesn't matter. Um, then they went the limits from zero to three, and the answer, x seven to three. We have five minutes, okay? Um, on the homework page, the Google Doc, the homework page, there's a link to a folder um, where I'm going to start putting AP practice stuff. If you want to get a five, which is possible, you are studying like uh, voraciously. I think that's a word. You're studying with like intensity. All right? That's. You are using your free time. Other than what I'm telling you you need to do, you are studying like crazy. You're practicing like crazy. And when you run into a challenging problem, you're finding out how to approach that problem by asking me, or if the practice test that you're looking at has solutions, we'll take those solutions as a last resort. All right, so. Where is that? They're right here. If you go to the homework page, they're right there. You click on it. Okay. I have one practice test in there right now that I scanned in this morning. It's got so the one that we just looked at. Can we all listen to the question? Um, the one that we've been working on is a little bit abbreviated. Um, on the multiple choice, it's shorter. On the free response, it's, it's just too long, but I haven't included all the questions. But this one is like a full length test. You can follow the directions, you can time yourself if you want, but I would just recommend spending a good amount of time every day, starting today, going over as many questions as you can, right? Spend an hour a day going over some questions. And if you don't know how to do them, try your hardest. And if you don't come to me and ask me, I'll help you out. Okay. We have other things that I'm going to ask you to do. If you want to get a five, you're studying really hard. If you want to get a four, you're studying hard. If you want to get a three, you're studying, you're practicing. If you want to get a two or a one, you know, you don't have to study too hard.